Hi, my name is Peter B. Goldis, and I'm a data science tech lead here at Wayfair. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the theory of machine learning. One of my favorite things about being a data scientist is listening to my colleagues from all their different backgrounds describe things that I already know in ways I never would have imagined. So today, I'm going to talk about multi-class classification from my perspective as a theoretical computer scientist. To me, things like this are natural processes governed by universal laws, and I try to understand those laws to produce insight. In the case of multi-class classification, I see this as an encoding problem and is therefore governed by information theory, which is the science of um, sending and receiving messages. So I intend today to describe what encoding is, give you some intuition for how that applies to machine learning that will allow us to explain why feature selection and ensembling work. So the first thing to say is, what is a text file? A text file is a list of numbers. These numbers are code words. I go look in a code book and convert those numbers to the symbol as represented by the code book. I am using ASCII for my code for pedagogical purposes. You should use UTF-8. But anyway, in ASCII, if I go look this up, I will find that this is the message Hi, Mom. Except actually, I'm lying to you. Because I told you that a text file is a list of numbers, and here I have written down a comma delimited list. So now I have a problem. Just looking at this, I don't know how to decode it. Is this a 7? Is this a 72? Is this a 721? The only reason you know is because I've written in these extra delimiters, which I'm not allowed to do. So, ASCII solves this problem in the, final, in the following way. First, we observe that there are, um, all the numbers in the code book are between 0 and 255, and therefore you can write them all down using three digits. So what I need to do is pad these. And so now this is unambiguously, the first three is 72, the next three is 105, the third three is 77, and so on. So that is a fixed width encoding. The other thing that you can do is a prefix-free coding. So I could instead have let 1 stand for A, 0, 1 stand for B, 0, 0, 1 stand for C, etc. And now you can see how this is ambiguous. Every time I see a 1, I just have to count back the number of zeros, and that tells me which letter I'm using. So if I write down 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, you can now unambiguously decode two zeros and a one is a C, no zeros and a one is an A, one zero and a one is a B. So this says cap. And this works. This is a code that I can use to write down the English alphabet. However, it's a bad one. The most common letter is an E. It's going to take me five zeros, four zeros. Doesn't matter. The next most common letter is a T. That's going to be a lot more zeros. That's going to give, make my text files un, un, unnecessarily large because I have to give all of those zeros for every E. So what I should do instead is have no zeros for an E, one zero for a T, three for an A, etc. So this actually is provably optimal using the language of information theory developed by Claude Shannon in 1948. So this is optimal from the perspective of conciseness. Um, but there are other forms of optimality. So what does this have to do with multi-class classification? Well, that's also an encoding problem. I have a very long list of numbers, a feature vector, and I now want to encode that as a single number, which is to say the label. So I need to take this huge thing, write it down very succinctly in a way that captures the information that, I, that I'm interested in. So this is a different criteria, because now I'm not looking at conciseness. I'm looking at accuracy. So the thing that is going to govern this is mutual information. If you imagine that all the information contained in features are a ball, and now all of the information contained in the labels are some other ball, 
And there's some information that these two things share. So this is known as the mutual information between the two. Now, you can imagine a situation where the features are completely independent of the labels. There is actually no overlap here, pure noise. The best accuracy you're ever going to be able to get is 50%, zero mutual information. You could also imagine that the labels are intact a subset of the features. These balls overlap entirely. Your um, classification accuracy should be 100%, and mutual information is, in fact, one. Now, in reality, the, in, the interaction between, the similarity between the features and the labels, the amount of information that they share varies. But the more information they share, the better you can do in terms of prediction. And in fact, you can compute this mutual information and use it to then compute an upper bound on the classification accuracy that you're going to be able to achieve. So this is a little bit about encoding, why encoding, um, why multi-class classification is an encoding problem. Here's a framework that you can use to describe encoding problems. OK, why am I bothering to do this? Well, I have taken this problem, viewed it as a natural process, discovered the laws that govern it, and now I can produce insight. Why does feature selection work? So remember, my goal is to take this huge vector and represent it as a single number. So clearly, I'm going to have to lose a lot of information. I'm going to have to forget a lot of things before I get down to the only piece of information I care about. So if I happen to know which things I don't want to bother encoding, then obviously, if I just take those columns out, there's less columns left to shrink. So there's the, the me that I've removed all of the extraneous information from my message before I try and write it down. OK, why does ensembling work? Well, if you go through the math of mutual information, you will find that if I start adding more balls, mutual information can only go up. You can't have an entirely new thing and have the mutual information go down. And so ensembling, provably, can't make it worse. And so that's why having a whole bunch of things that are a little bit good are better than having one thing that's really good. It can only ever add. So this was my goal to teach you that it's really fun to listen to data scientists talk about random things in the way that they come to it from their particular backgrounds. Thanks for listening. Check back again soon to hear more about the projects we're tackling here on Data Science at Wafer.